Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Folks, Kabbalah is a school of Jewish mysticism that has been around for centuries. Today, it's experiencing a revival in popularity with pop stars like Madonna and Ariana Grande becoming advocates of it. But there are controversies surrounding Kabbalah or Kabbalah. One of them is its history. Kabbalists claim that its teachings go back more than 3,000 years. But modern academic scholars have challenged this. So what is the truth about Kabbalah? Where did it come from? And what happened in its turbulent history? You're listening to episode 219 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the teachings of the Jewish school of mysticism known as Kabbalah. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Kabbalism is a school of Jewish mysticism that's been experiencing a new wave of popularity with celebrity pop stars embracing it. Last week, we talked about its controversial history, and today we'll be talking about its controversial teachings. Kabbalists hold that these teachings were held secret for thousands of years, but now they're publicly known. So what do Kabbalists believe about God, the creation of the world, the origin of evil, and the afterlife? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what would you like to say before we dive into today's interview? Not a lot. As I explained last week, this is part two of a two-part discussion with the Jewish scholar, Dr. Justin Sledge. He's an expert in esoteric matters, including Kabbalah. Last week, we had a really fascinating discussion on the history of Kabbalah, and so this time we'll be looking at the teachings of the movement. So this is where, from both a traditional Christian and a traditional Jewish perspective, things start to get really, really weird. All right. Looking forward to that. Before we do get to that, I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Jason M., Tim C., Declan M., Adam R., and James D. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fearvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com. Um, so we've kind of covered some of the major movements in, or uh, shifts, I should say, in uh, in the history of Kabbalah. Let's talk about what Kabbalists believe. What do they believe about God? All right. So this is where things get very complicated very fast. Um, all right. So Kabbalists believe that God began as an infinite nothingness. And inside that nothingness, there was a moment of God's will, a movement of will. And that movement of will ultimately caused a kind of differentiation within the inner recesses of the Godhead. We, according to Kabbalists, we can't know anything about that, but there was some kind of internal differentiation that happened. And that internal differentiation caused the Godhead to begin to move um, or begin to, to move or to begin to express itself, I guess one could say. And as that movement and expression began to unfold, you can imagine, um, I'm sure most folks here have uh, like uh, heated up a, a kettle of milk to heat milk. When you do that moment, there's that always that moment right when the milk begins to heat up, or if you don't stop it, it'll just overflow over everything. Mm -hmm. That's the image that, uh, that um, the Kabbalists like to use for God. It's an overflow. And that overflow, the emanation, is where the, the, the Godhead actually overflows from itself. And that overflow takes 10 distinct forms. And those 10 distinct forms are referred to as the spherot. These are 10 distinct moments in the development of the Godhead. 
And they represent things like wisdom and mercy and judgment and victory and endurance. And these 10 distinct spherot represent the internal dynamism of the Godhead. Now, some they're folks, attributes of God. They're attributes of God, but they're but they're but they're a little stronger than attributes. There are other attributes of God as well, but they're never they're never um, qualified as their own moments within the Godhead. So these are distinct moments, and these very distinct moments are in a constant kind of tension, tensive relationship with each other, and they're out of balance. And because they're out of balance, um, and there's complex reasons why they come out of balance. That out of balance ultimately leads, according to um, according to the um, to Isaac Luria, there's an idea that God has to withdraw God's self, and into that withdrawal, right, God shoots light into the dark, and that light interacts with the world as we would know it, sort of the the unformed world, the tohu vavohu is what it's called in Hebrew, the unformedness, mm-hmm. and God's light feels it and shatters it, and into that shattered reality which become sort of demonic beings in the Kabbalah, um, those uh, klipot, the shattered shards. It's into that that the world that we know it comes into existence. And so streaming down from the inner recesses of the inner darkness of the divine is pure light. And that light comes down, all right, takes 10 distinct forms, and eventually the last form it takes is our realm. And that is where we exist. Now, the task of the Kabbalist, and we may talk more about this in a minute, the task of the Kabbalist is to realign the supernal realm. And that realigning, that tikkun ulam, the reparation of the world, ultimately redeems the entire world. And at some point, this entire cosmic drama comes to an end. And that's with the, the coming of the Messiah. So the basic idea, just to recap, to repent, to sort of recapulate all this is there's a sort of nothingness that is the Godhead. Out of that nothingness, there's a withdrawal, what is called simsum, contraction. Mm-hmm. Into that contraction, uh, this always imagine the contraction is like that moment after you've like had too much at Thanksgiving and you have to like suck your belly in to put your belt on. It's that moment of contraction. Into that contraction flows the divine light. That divine light breaks into different vessels, into different shards. And by the time it gets down to us and our creation, our task is to repair, to be partners in that and into the repairing of the world. So it's a very different idea than creatio ex nihil, right? Creation from nothing that you would find in Maimonides or Thomas Aquinas. Um, and so it's much more neoplatonic and that is an emanation scheme. God is sort of flowing out of God's self. Um, and it's also not the idea that God is there to save you, but also that you have a direct role in the reparation of God. Mm-hmm. And so this is where things get very strange for, I think, many uh, Christians and Muslims Whereas the idea is that there's a very asymmetrical relationship, right? That uh, human beings have no power to save themselves and certainly not fix God. But in Kabbalah, God's goodness and human goodness have to work together in order to repair the entire world and re- realign the world of the divine. So it's a much more cooperative idea mm-hmm. as to why, why, the, why the world exists at all. Yeah, Christians would say that um, that uh, at least classically that God associates us with His work, and that there is an aspect in which, by doing good in the world, we bring about His kingdom or aspects of His kingdom, and thus repair the world in that sense. But we ain't fixing God. Yeah, yeah. This is where this, and you can see where uh, where Kabbalah could become a very. It, you can see why it was. It, deemed heretical at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. You're like, what do you mean God has to be repaired? And they would, the Kabbalists would say, yeah, God is what God will be. Uh, you know, ehia asher ehia. I will, I am becoming what I will be. I will be what I will be. That's Not a quotation that I, from Exodus. From right? Exodus, right. Yeah. Not that I am what I am, right? Because in, you know, that's, that's where, this is where Hebrew grammar is very different than English grammar or Latin grammar, mm-hmm. where there's a sense that God isn't done yet. That God is a process. And that process isn't over. Right. I was going to say, I was going to say, it sounds like in Christian terms, this is process theology where God is not an internal, unchanging outside of time ground of all being. He's instead involved in some kind of internal process that, that has stages. Right. Right. Definitely has stages. And those stages are going on Mm -hmm. 
uh, even now, even now that, um, and we can have direct impact on how that, how that shapes, how that mm -hmm. shapes up. So I wanted to go back over uh, what you said and relate it to some terms and images that people may have encountered. Mm -hmm. um, so you start with God as this initial undifferentiated reality that's beyond what we can conceive. And that's uh, and so we it, this is a, kind of an extreme version of negative theology. Right. Um, we can't. Negative theology is where you can say what God is not like God is not a man or God is not evil, but it's harder to have words grasp the reality of what God is. And so this is kind of an extreme form of negative theology. And this understanding of God in Kabbalah is Ein Sof, or right. sometimes pronounced in Sof. Um, there's, a, there's a pun there in Hebrew, right? Uh, uh -huh. So with a one, the, uh, uh, Ein Sof means the infinite without end, mm -hmm. and Ein Sof, right? Same, almost the same spelling, right? Is mm -hmm. the sea of nothingness. Mm -hmm. And so it's, yeah, it's a complete undifferentiated nothing, right? Uh, because God can't be something that's idolatry, right? right? And so God, if there's, God is not something, God must be no thing. And that's the undifferentiated ein sof, the infiniteness of, mm -hmm. of God, the no thingness of God. And there's even a kind of parallel, which is not to deny God's existence. Um, there's even a kind of parallel in some Christian circles where you'll have some Christians, and this is really a definitional matter, but some Christians won't like to say God is a supreme being because that would imply he's like a single concrete thing when really he's the ground of all beings. Or, or a being among beings. Yeah. 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 So, and in fact, it does lead, there is a kind of mystical atheism that does actually develop out of Kabbalah that says that any belief in a God is idolatry because it's a conception of it. And so this is actually where Kabbalah gets really close to things like Meister Eckhart. Mm -hmm. um, that, or Paul uh, Tillich. Or Paul Tillich, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah, and this is, of course, my shirt almost, you know, had he not died, uh, he would have been promptly excommunicated. Uh, but uh, you get, you know, or, you know, or maybe an extreme version of pseudo Dionysius. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, so we begin with this undifferentiated no thingness. That's the, that's the initial starting point as much as there is one. And so we have this infinite sea, and then we have this event called symptom, where the sea contracts. And the way I visualize this, and you can tell me if this is a common visualization, but it's like um, the sea contracts so that it opens up a hole, like a bubble in itself. Right. And then into that bubble uh, within the sea, uh, God shines light and you get the differentiation of this light into the tin spherot. And right. these are often pictured now. Oh, I should mention for people who are just reading the word in an English text, it's going to look like sephirot. Right. But it's actually pronounced spherot rather than sephirot. And um, one of the most common images that people will see, like if you go online or read a book about Kabbalah, you'll see this image of these 10 circles that are connected in a kind of tree-like diagram that is often called the tree of life. Right. And the circles represent the spherot or the different aspects of God, like mercy and strictness and uh, and the others that you mentioned. And so that's what that diagram is. That's representing these different aspects of God's character. Um, and, and so when you see that tree-like diagram, that's what's being talked about. Right. And in, in the medieval literature, their favorite image is actually the fountains at the very center of medieval towns, right? Where you have the, the water coming out of the top, right? And it flows down to one, then to two, then to three, and it's like, it goes down like that. They love the image of the fountain. Uh, for some reason, I always imagine at weddings, when you hear like uh, people pouring champagne mm -hmm. under the top, right? Imagine the champagne is Ain Sof and the light flowing down from the different glasses from one to the other is, is the, the light flowing down um, via, via the Godhead. Um, but they have lots of different images. But yeah, you can imagine a sea, right? Imagine the sea sort of receding. Um, and it's into that emptiness that is where uh, God's light will eventually emerge from the mm -hmm. the uh, the. Uh, it's actually in, in the in the Aramaic. It's the lamp of adamantine darkness is what God is referred to as at that moment. 
the light uh, of unbreakable darkness. Yeah, the light of unbreakable of, of light of unbreakable darkness, which is a, this is the kind of language that Zohar loves to use. Well, mystics uh, generally love paradoxes. Oh yeah, so they're bread and butter. I don't care what they they can be. Uh, any all these mystics love this kind of paradoxical language. Um, but yeah. yeah, that's the Botsina de Cardinuta is what it literally is. Um, um, mm-hmm. In fact, the word Cardi, uh, the word Cardinuta, Botsina just means a lamp in Aramaic, but uh, de Cardinuta uh, actually comes from the name of, a, of, uh, of when you're grinding wheat, there are mm-hmm. always some of the part of wheat that no matter how hard you grind it, it will never turn into flour. It's just unbreakable. Mm. Um, and it's the image of the unbreakable piece of, of wheat. Um, um, and so it's that, that's where the, the root of the word comes from. So it's the mm-hmm. unbreakable and we translate it into, into English as adamantine, uh, uh, from, yeah. Most people think when they hear adamantine, they think like Wolverine, yeah, Wolverine with his, and, his claws. adamantium claws, but originally adamant yeah. just meant, uh, unbreakable or very hard to break. Right. Yeah. So as the divine light is is manifesting in the space that's been opened for it, um, the the action of the light is so powerful or so violent or something that it causes this brokenness, right? Which affects our world as well. And so on this conception, it's not the abuse of free will like on the part of the devil or on behalf of on behalf of humanity it's not the the abuse of free will that creates evil it's actually a result of a process that god initiated that's right evil has two distinct origins in kabbalah one of them is where imagine this light flows down from keter the crown of god and it flows down first into um chesed mercy god's mercy, mercy. Right. It's the first aspect that God's it flows down into. Well, imagine that what ends up happening is the, the, the flow, right, is so powerful that it flows out of mercy and flows directly over into the opposite of mercy. Judgment. Strictness or strictness. Judgment. Yeah. yeah. Dean, judgment, strictness. And imagine that as it's flowing down, it flows so hard that God's strictness, if God's strictness is unchecked by God's mercy, some of that pure strictness, that pure justice leaks out the other side. It's almost as if it it flows and then it leaks out as it flows. And that pure judgment without being checked by mercy is one of the sources of evil. Mm -hmm. So it's actually part of God that goes unchecked, right? That that unchecked judgment. Uh, And I'm sure we've experienced that, right? Where you know you're in the right and you can, you're like, you know you're in the right and you usually just yell and you go overboard with it. You're too strict. That's the idea of evil in, Mm -hmm. in, in Kabbalah. There's another one, and it's the one you just mentioned. The container that, that this is all fitting into, the, the, the simsum, the contracted area, nothing can withstand the light of God. Nothing. There's no container, right? It, it, this is a, an, a completely unimaginable task. And so the very container that, is the, 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 that the, contraction is, the contraction is made out of breaks. The vessel breaks. And those shards become also evil. They become a different kind of evil. They're called the klipot, the husks, the shards. And those become the origin of the demons in, in Judaism and in Kabbalah. Um, and those in that brokenness, right? The task of Kabbalah is to do two things, is to heal that brokenness. And also, right, and you mentioned the tree of life diagram, right? That tree of life diagram represents all the spherot in perfect harmony. They're never like that in Kabbalah. They're always slightly out of harmony. So that's and the goal. That's is the to goal. Get, is to help the spherot be balanced in that way. Right. To redeem the klipot, right? And that is a, a spiritual act of redemption to rebuild this shattered vessel and then to rebalance the, these, this, these divine forces back into complete harmony. And with the vessel repaired and with the, the divine reharmonized, that is the messianic age. Okay. Now, um, I know so, this sounds all really. This may sound all really bizarre to people. Um, well, and, and it's, it is it, pretty. It is pretty bizarre. But, yeah, um, and it, but, and it, it's easy to see why the early Kabbalists met with such opposition, including in the Jewish community. Absolutely. In fact, the famous uh, quote, right, is, um, um, you know, you Kabbalists, right? And and I mean, no offense to my to my Christian cousins out there. They say, look, the Christians made God three. 
but you guys did even worse and made God 10. Like, how dare you? Like, you know, mm-hmm. like, it's like, we we're also some monotheistic and the, like, what are you doing in this Tim? Um, and, well, and so, yeah, and, this was a huge criticism, the idea that, and they're like, no, it's not really 10 different gods and things like this. But uh, the criticism was very powerful. And they thought, look at this bizarre system you've made and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, it was, mm-hmm. um, it was, it was, it was unpopular at first and it gained in popularity and, and is now at some level the dominant theology and Judaism. So we've covered the actual origin of evil, but in my original list of questions, um, uh, one question was, according to Kabbalah, what is the origin of evil and why is it Brill Academic Publishing? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so folks who may not know out there, um, there's a publishing company in the Netherlands called Brill, and they, God bless them, they, they publish stuff that no one else is going to publish. You know, they publish obscure things, and they publish it really, really nicely, and they publish mm-hmm. it really great. But they want an arm and a leg for yeah. their uh, for their books. I mean, a Brill book can easily run you 800 bucks. Um, I know, I've got a few, and, yeah. it's, and it's like, man, their cheap stuff is still way expensive I want $200 and, for an ebook. Uh, I know it's like, yeah. dude, you're not even printing on paper for that. Yeah. You know, it, it's, um, I mean, it, the reason, I mean, it's a supply and demand thing, right? It's they're, they're printing books for libraries. And so yeah. they're basically printing, they're printing very, very high quality books for a thousand libraries. And when they, when they, uh, when you see them on Amazon, that price doesn't re- represent what's going on. It's just that uh, they think they can't imagine anyone is any individual person is going to buy this. Yeah, I know. It's like guys discover the world of independent scholars. Yeah. You know, or, or just, uh, yeah, get a print on demand machine. Like I've, if I ever meet the real people, which I will, I'm going to the AAR, SBL, the American Academy mm-hmm. of Religion. I'll, I'll meet them because they're there. And I'll, will I'll you meet. take a tire iron with you? Yeah. I'm going to just bring a protest sign. Just like, uh, <laughs> uh, they just need to buy one of those print on demand machines. That, yeah. That, uh, I don't mind a book that's not high quality, and you know that that I don't even I don't even want a paper book. I want electronic, and yeah. there's no duplication cost for that. Yeah, it's yeah, it, it's it's a business model. I mean, Brill dates back to the 17th century or something, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. Like hundreds of years old. Yeah, and so they just I think they're still living in like the 70s or something. They 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 just haven't academic publishing. And it's not just Brill. There's also uh, 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 Oxford the, and Cambridge, and yeah, and, and yeah. they're bad, but they're still they're still you can still they're get better. a sixty dollar Oxford book. Yeah, um, um, and even the SBL, the Society for Biblical Literature, they publish really high level books on Ugaritic myth with the Ugaritic text there, and they cost forty dollars. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's just that Brill has not Brill's still living in the seventeenth century. <laughs> Yeah, they, they have. Uh, they're they're not. They they have not adjusted for the for the price of books going down. They're still using 17th century book prices. They're, they're probably still afraid of the next tulip bubble and how that will decimate their economy or something. Yeah, and they're still yeah working out of the East India Trade Company or whatever. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, so a little bit of Brill bonding aside, <laughs> um, what, now we covered a little bit of this, but what do Kabbalists believe we're supposed to be doing in this life or what's the goal of practicing K- Kabbalah? Like, for example, you know, in Christianity, the goal is of practicing Christianity is to go to heaven and help other people go to heaven and be loving and help other people and so forth. And there are aspects of that that sound kind of like the tikkun olam or the repair of the world that Kabbalists are interested in. But is, is there's also in Christianity a kind of mystical union with God that's part of the goal. It's not just doing good in the world. It's not just a social gospel. Right. It's also having a personal or mystical union with, with deity. How, how is, what's the goal in Kabbalah? Yeah. So this, to understand the answer to this question, you have to, rewind a bit and understand what is Kabbalah responding to and what Kabbalah is responding to is Jewish rationalism. That is to say Maimonides mm-hmm. and Maimonides. So Maimonides is kind of like the Jewish Thomas Aquinas. He was a yeah. theologian philosopher in the 1200s and he wrote a book called with a great title, the guide for the perplexed, right. uh, which actually has a lot of fascinating stuff in it. 
No, oh, of course. And uh, Thomas read it. In fact, he refers in the Summa in the Summa to the rabbi, and it's almost always uh, Maimonides, uh, Maimonides mm-hmm. uh, which I've always really appreciated. Thomas being ecumenical that way, mm-hmm. uh, he would just say the rabbi, and he never like threw shade. And uh, you know, or he said the commentator, and he meant uh, uh, a Aver- Aver- Averroes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he never threw shade at him. I always appreciated Thomas's. Uh, and ecumenicalism on that one. And that the regard. philosopher is Aristotle. Aristotle. And he's he's a pagan. He's a pagan. Um, so yeah, I've always appreciated. I love Thomas. Uh, more of a dumb Scotus man myself, but I I, I, mm-hmm. I I have my my healthy appreciation for Thomas. Well, to to you know to point your to put a finer point on what you just said, Maimonides goes even farther than Thomas. Um, mm-hmm. I think my in fact so far that you know Jews actively burned Maimonides' works after they were written because he, they thought that he was basically an atheist. Um, Thomas, or rather, so Maimonides. He was, he was kind of the Baruch Spinoza of his day. Yeah, and people have actually said that Spinoza and Maimonides are actually more similar than they are different. And I've mm-hmm. I've always been on that camp. I'm a big fan of Maimonides. Mm-hmm. Um, big fan of Gersonides, but whatever. Um, at any rate, uh, Maimonides basically argued that any talk about God's body is is uh, is basically um, an allegory, metaphor. Mm-hmm. Angels are basically a metaphor, with the exception of ten angels. Demons are completely a metaphor. They are none of those. Um, and that the laws of Israel are basically conventions that were simply invented by God and Moses to basically get the Israelites to be moral. But they're not divine in any strict sense. So if, if, if Moses would have been a Dine person, a Navajo person, they would have gotten a different set of laws. It just so happened mm-hmm. they happened to be Israelites, so they got those laws. So the laws, in some sense, are convention. Now. We hear that out for a second. The laws are just convention, ultimately. You have to follow them because they're going to make you a good person, but ultimately they're convention. Fast forward to Spain, 1490. You're being told either you convert or you leave. Well, do you really want to leave a place you've been for hundreds of years? You have a good job. You're a doctor. You make a lot of money. And in fact, if you're told if you convert, we'll give you land. We'll, give, we'll, we'll, we'll make you settle, you know, We'll give you all kinds of things. Just convert. Now, of course, they don't tell you the Inquisition is going to be on your trail for the next hundred years or whatever, but convert. Well, if you're one of these Maimonidean rationalists and the law is just convention and God is really just the force beyond all things that's making the world work, you could just as well pray in a church as you could in a synagogue. And so many people converted. Many of these rationalists converted. Well, the Kabbalists said, no, absolutely not. God's law is not a convention. God's law is the immutable law of the universe. Not only is it the immutable law of the universe, it is the mechanism and the only mechanism by which the world will be repaired. It is the metaphysical tool that we use to repair the world. And by only by scrupulously following the exact letter of the law, can one ever hope to actually achieve redemption. And that's not just redemption for the Jewish people, it'd be redemption for everybody. Now, I should also mention that the Kabbalah also has a very strong anti-Gentile streak to it. Uh, This is some really, uh, in my opinion, some of the most disgusting stuff ever written in Judaism about about non-Jewish people. I find it repugnant and repulsive. I'm I'm aware of that stuff, but also in fairness, all of our ancestors didn't play together well. Sure. So no, and there's he, it, there's anti-Semitism on the Christian side, and right. some of that is really, really vile, too. Right, right. And I think it's just important to name when, when there's religious bigotry, it's just good to name it and be like, look, it's there. It's bad. It, you can explain it. I mean, who was going to what Jew is going to be super positive about Christians in the 1480s, 1490s. Right. I mean, they're not yeah. living in great times. That explains it doesn't justify it. And so any Jew out there who wants to use Kabbalah as a way of propping up their anti, um, anti-Gentile anti bigotry. That's super gross and bad, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is where Kabbalah is kind of weird. It's scrupulously legal. It just says the way that you come to fix, to repair the world is through very closely following the law. And the, especially the things that the Maimonideans, the rationalists had ignored. So I'll give you one example. Um, the Torah forbids a certain kind of uh, mixing of fabric. You're not right. allowed to uh, knit together or, uh, or to, um, to uh, mix wool and linen. That's right. forbidden in Jewish law. It's called shadnitz. And most people ignored that in the Middle Ages because it's hard to get clothes. And if you can get wool and linen, 
and you and you can make clothes and make them. The Kabbalist said, no, actually, Schadnitz calls the demons. And you are making the world objectively worse by making Schadnitz and worse wearing it. Now, what was the connection with Schadnitz and demons? So the idea is that you can either be repairing the world or filling it with more evil. It's, it's really dualistic in this regard. And the idea is that everything has a place. And if you create something that goes against God's law, you're actually filling things with more demonic presence. Okay. And so the Zohar is so, obsessed with demons, actually. Yeah. And there's something similar in Christian circles where you'll hear people saying, oh, if you read Harry Potter or, oh, if you watch Lord of the Rings, you're opening yourself to the demonic. And yeah. they're essentially saying the same thing about clothing. Yeah, about clothing, about something as simple as, you know, wearing a shirt. Mm -hmm. but of course, you're not just wearing a shirt. You're wearing a shirt that openly flouts God's law, the keeping of the Sabbath, any law, any law at all. and this is where the Kabbalah is very conservative because it's all about keeping God's law because many Jews at that time had been very relaxed about it. They thought this is mostly metaphors. So why do we have to literally take boxes, put scripture in it, and then bind it to our arms and our head? It's clearly a metaphor, right? And you shall bind the Lord's, the, the commandments yeah. to your arm. And your, it's like you wear it just, foot between your eyes. That just means, or at least a, a understanding the role of metaphor in scripture that would commonly be understood apart from the way the cultural practice evolved of uh, w would just be understood as be really familiar with the law. Think about it all the time, act on it and right. take it really seriously. Right. And except for, you know, and in Jewish law, we actually literally wear them on our arms and on our foreheads. And mm -hmm. that was a law that got pushed to the wayside in the Middle Ages. And these Kabbalists came along and said, absolutely not. Now, do you get to get union with the divine? No. Judaism is, uh, unlike, I think, Christian mysticism and Islamic mysticism, which are much more okay with some kind of uh, union or mystica, the union with the divine, mystical union with the divine, Judaism has never really got on that train. And part of the reason why is that um, God is ultimately unknowable. And so the task is not so much union with the divine as much as it is the, to the repair of the world to usher in the Messianic age in which everything is at peace. Okay. So it's much more practically oriented as a form of mysticism than it is experientially. So, for instance, in the Zohar, uh, the major text of the, of the Kabbalah, you get almost no mentions of experience. Uh, very little about experience or mystical experiences. Whereas when you read um, someone like Heidewig or Julian of Norwich or, or um, St. John of the Cross, uh, you get, it's all experience. These are very powerful experiences. Uh, so the Kabbalah is, um, is um, I don't say bereft of them, but it's just not the way that the mysticism works. Yeah. It's much more a speculation about how to do it and how to do it than it is the and experience of doing it. Before we get to that question, um, I wanted to ask uh, one that occurred to me as you were describing the Kabbalistic view of the law of, of Moses as divine. Mm -hmm. um, so coming at it from an outsider, what I'd like to do is ask you an outsider perspective question, and maybe you can tell me how, a Kabbal how you think a Kabbalist might respond. Mm -hmm. So if coming from an outsider perspective, it looks like various uh, laws in the, uh, in the Torah are based on conventions that, you know, uh, the Israelites would have had before, like they probably were not eating pork before the law was given. They would have found it disgusting because if you don't eat, a, if you don't grow up eating a certain food, you will find it disgusting um, for biological reasons we don't need to go into. That's it, at least that happens with meats. Right. Um, and, um, and so probably you had a, a a pork taboo uh, prior to the giving of the law, and then God sanctified that, made it part of his law as a way of helping uh, keep the Israelites culturally distinct from their pagan neighbors so they wouldn't be tempted to embrace paganism. And so this was a, there's nothing wrong with eating pork, but, um, but this was a way of helping the Israelites remain religiously true to God by isolating them for their, from their pork eating idol worshiping neighbors um, in particular. So that to my mind 
as an outsider would be one example of how a convention that even though there's nothing wrong with eating pork in and of itself can play a role and receive a divine blessing for the Jewish people as, okay, we're going to do this now because it'll be helpful. Mm -hmm. And so there's a rational basis for it, even though it's not intrinsically required. And I'm, in, I'm trying to articulate this off the top of my head, but another example that I think even more clearly brings out the historically rooted nature of some of the laws is the restriction of the Jewish priesthood to the uh, to the tribe of Levi and to the family of Aaron, mm-hmm. because there's a certain point where it's in fact it's it's um after the golden calf incident and you have a mixing of of israelites and pagans and all of the levites rally to moses to deal with the problem and moses tells the israelites you know today you have ordained yourselves and so they become the priest they become the the tribe that's associated with the priesthood, the priesthood comes from their number. Whereas originally any male head of the household, any patriarch could offer sacrifice. Right. And now it's restricted because of these historical events. And, um, and in fact, it, at various periods in Jewish history, there have even been cases where, well, okay, if you're a Gentile and you want to worship the God of Israel, well, that's a good thing. Um, but uh, what if you're a Gentile and you want to sacrifice to the God of Israel? Well, according to some readings of Jewish law, that's actually allowed. And there have been cases where Jewish scholars would instruct Gentiles and, in, okay, here's how you offer sacrifice to, to the God of Israel. Um, so all of this looks, from an outsider's perspective, like the restriction of the priesthood to this one family line that looks like it's historically conditioned not something that that is in, that intrinsically has to be that way and if that doesn't intrinsically have to be that way because the patriarchs before weren't of that family um then maybe other things like the pork taboo doesn't have to be that way of its own nature it's just this was god's will for 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 the people of Israel. How would, how do you suppose a Kabbalist might respond to that line of argument? I think they would say that what's happening there is that, um, and this is where Kabbalah can actually come across as weirdly determinative, which is to say that God is, all of the things around us are actually God coming into God's being. And that history isn't an accident. That when when Abraham does this, or when Jacob did this, or when Leah did that, it's not just that Abraham, Jacob, and Leah are doing these things. It's that those are actually representative of motions within the Godhead. And therefore, the entire Torah is not only a story about the patriarchs and matriarchs and Moses and all that. It's also the inner dynamism of the Godhead symbolically written out. And so they would say, no, it's not historically contingent. It's not the case that they could have built the golden calf and they could have not built the golden calf. It's that, no, the golden calf was part of the process by which God, God's nature is being worked out in history. So now you might say, where is free will and all that? Uh, the Kabbalists are disinterested in that question. It's really amazing how they don't care about it. Um, do, but, they re- do they actively reject free will or are they just uninterested in it? So they, they seem to th- there's a there's some debate about this. They they largely are disinterested in it. Um, again, this is one of these things where it seems to really bother some theologians. And in, in Judaism, there's very little interest in it. Um, but the idea basically is that this is the divine working itself out in history. And insofar as the divine is intelligent, is intelligence, it is working itself out actively, and we're part of that process. Now, the degree to which we're choosing everything is not completely clear. Um, But yeah, exactly where free will and determinism line up is a very murky question in, in 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 the Kabbalah. But generally speaking, the idea is that um there's some kind of compatibilism happening there. Um, but in general, they really do think that um the Torah is not just a history of people, it's also a history of things within the Godhead. Uh, I'll give you one example of this that sounds completely bizarre, but I love it. Um, there's a throwaway verse in Genesis, and it says, They were ten kings of Edom and they all died. That's the verse. 
right? <laughs> it's the kind of thing that, you know, it's the kind of Bible thing we always see, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just one of these weird throwaway verses. Um, not for the Zohar. Zohar says, those ten, 10 kings of Edom were the 10 evil worlds that existed, pr- that existed prior to our world. And that the 10 kings of Edom are now the demons that are in control of this world. And that the, it's not just a random list of Edomite kings. The 10 kings of Edom are actually part of the, the evil superstructure of, of reality that have to be actively combated against. And so the Zohar has a very complicated demonology. And these 10 kings of Edom are actually, you know, we talk about the 10 Sphirot. Yep. They're the opposite of that. They're the, they're the evil bizarro, like in, you know, the bizarro version, right? It's like a, a Mr. Spock with a mustache. It's the evil version. No, so, I, was, I was thinking like bizarro Superman, you know, me am sad, have a sad birthday or, you know, yeah, like that. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, and the, the world of, this is called the world of the Sitra Akra, the world of the other side. And it's, it's our world, it penetrates our world, but it's a completely evil version of our world. And actively we have to, it's full of demons, and those demons can get into our world, and we have to like do commandments to fight against them. And so mm-hmm. this becomes a very Baroque uh, worldview where demons and dibics, which are evil undead people. And, right. And, and we're going to cover dibics in the future. Yeah. Amulets and all kinds of stuff are very common in the Kabbalistic world. So um, magic even um, is mm-hmm. part of Kabbalah. And so, um, yeah, it's a very, very weird world. That's very super saturated with evil. I and mean, it's actually the Kabbalistic world is a very frightening world because it's a world in which, I mean, again, it's super arrogant. But the Kabbalists really did believe that the world's hanging on by a thread, and they're the thread. So um, th- let's talk about how they go about repairing it then. What does Kabbalistic practice look like? What do, what do people do? Is it just go into soup kitchens, or what else does it involve? So that's, that could be one thing. The main thing is the law. It's following as many, it's following all the commandments of God uh, as laid out in um, in the in the. Uh, the Torah as possible. Classically so reckoned as being 613 of them. 613, although 100 of those have to do with the temple. So those are not, strictly speaking, possible at this point. Although they're read every day, you have to know them because uh, in rabbinical Judaism, the third temple may reappear at any moment and all of the Levites and everyone has to be immediately go back to their job. So hey. uh, so you have to like know them. Um, uh, they're studied every day by Orthodox Jews. So And also the... The idea in rabbinical Judaism is that uh, the temple's destroyed, but we now make our home the temple. And so uh, in the same way that the uh, the priests would make the bread and sprinkle salt on it as part of the sacrifice, when you make bread, you have to also pinch off some of the bread, throw it in your oven, sprinkle salt over it, just like the priests. Your table is now the temple. And so um, I've always thought it was a beautiful idea. Just like you wash your hands before you eating, before you eat in Judaism, there's a ritual washing of the hands that mirrors the washing of the hands of the priests. So the law basically is just that you follow the 613 commandments. You follow them to the letter, Mm -hmm. um, and that redeems the world. That redeems the world. Now, this is where things get more interesting, I guess, is that not only do you have to follow the law, you have to encourage other Jews to follow the law. Now, this is where you get what is called kiruv, or outreach. Jews don't do proselytizing. There is no, Jews do not proselytize. In fact, the old legend goes that if a, a, a non-Jewish person comes to a rabbi and asks to be converted to Judaism, the rabbi's job is to turn them away at least three times. You're like, no, you don't want to do this, bad idea, you don't want to convert. But you can do outreach to other Jews, kiruv. And this is where those guys in the street asking if you're Jewish and you want to lay to fill them, the boxes that go on your arm and your head, that's what they're out there for. The idea is all of Jews need to be brought back into Orthodox Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, and that is the process of redeeming the world, really. So it's not enough that you do what's right, right? It's also that you have to get other Jews to also engage in this tikkun olam. And it gets even crazier. In Lurianic Kabbalah, reincarnation is introduced. I was just going to go to... What do Kabbalists believe happens after death? Yeah, so you get reincarnated. Um, This is, uh, what ends up happening is there's what's called uh, Sha'are HaGilgolim, the gates of reincarnation. Now, this idea is not found in the Zohar directly, but it comes in later Kabbalah. 
And the idea is um, not only do you spend this entire life engaging in the repair of the world, you'll get reborn. And depending on the merit you've achieved in, achieved in this life, you will go on to have to even do harder lifting later. And so um, the idea is you get reborn and you have to do the same thing again. Not only that, but there are a finite number of souls in the universe, according to Kabbalah, and that those and, finite souls- And they were all created at the same time. All created at the same time. And there are a finite number of them. And your job is not only to do the repair for the sins that you have made in the world, so you have to correct for your sins and do the positive commandments, but you're responsible for all the other people you used to be. You have to fix all their sins too. And so I'll give you one example of this. This is called your soul root. You have to do these Kabbalistic exercises to figure out what your soul root was. And depending on your, your previous life, you may have to do all kinds of reparation. Is that soul R-O-U-T-E, soul route, or soul R-O-O-T, oh, yeah. soul R root? Yeah, root, R-O-O-T, like the okay. root of your, like the like a plant, the first soul that you were. And uh, Chaim Vital, uh, the first student of Isaac Luria, his soul root was Cain. He oh, was responsible boy. for every murder to have ever occurred in all of history. Heavy. Heavy, <laughs> right? And so you learn your soul root, and your soul root may have been Korach, you may have been Pharaoh, you may have been God knows, but you're responsible for them. And this is the idea in Kabbalah that you have to be scrupulous with the following of the commandments, but you also have an obligation to figure out all the things you did in your past life and fix that too. And how do you fix that? Doing good deeds, praying. Um, you can do like things like mortification of the flesh. Uh, you can do all kinds of things uh, uh, that will allow you to repair those sins. So you're responsible for all your sins, doing the right thing, and fixing all the sins of the people that have come before you. Now, um, so I'm curious about something because part of the obligation to do tikkun olam is is connected to Jewish identity. So it's not expected that Gentiles like me need to need to keep the 613 laws in order to repair the world. Um, but in um, in Kabbalistic reincarnation, it is possible. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I've I've read this in in multiple places, um, it is possible if you commit various offenses that you will be reincarnated as an animal or even a plant or even an inanimate object like a river. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're those things, you're not a Jewish person anymore. You're not right. part of the covenant. And it doesn't look like you'd uh, be required to to perform tikkun olam to repair the world in that case. Do Kabbalists think that like reincarnationally, once a Jew, always a Jew, or do you have Gentiles who get incarnated as Jews and then pick up this obligation? Or if you're a, if you're a Jew and you, and you get reincarnated as a non-Jew, as a Gentile, let's say, do you lose the obligation? How does that work? Yeah, that's the joke I always tell my my uh, non-Jewish friends of mine. It's like, be good, but don't be too good. Because if you're too good, you'll get reborn a Jew. Uh, um, and so, so there's a hierarchy. And this hierarchy is super bigoted. I'm not going to lie. It's just, I don't like it. It's hierarchy. It's, it's, a, it's a bigoted hierarchy. Jews are at the top. Priests are at the top of that. Right? Messiah is at the top of that. Down from there, if you're a man and you muck up, you can get reborn a woman. Right? right. Uh, and if you're a bad woman or a sufficiently bad Israelite man, you can be reborn a Gentile and it goes down and down and down until you can be reborn um, basically as an inanimate object. Um, so the idea is that assuming you're human, right? Assuming you're human and even among animals, there are some animals that are considered better than other animals. For instance, pigs, as you mentioned earlier, are associated with demonic forces. So much so, by the way, that Kabbalistic households will not have children's books in them with pictures of pigs. Oh, so this is the equivalent of don't read Harry Potter. It's like, don't read the three little pigs. Yeah, the three little pigs. No, no, no. They'll, they will like, they'll sometimes have the book. I've been to households where they'll have the book, but they've taken a Sharpie and like, like gotten mm -hmm. rid of the pig or cut it out. Mm -hmm. um, so even having pictures of these animals is considered to be idolatrous. It's like you're on the, you know, uh, 
you're on the wrong team leaving with pictures of these animals. So there's some, even there's a hierarchy of animals that you'd want to be born into um, um, as opposed to others. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea, yeah, is that even if you're, again, no, with all not, the, not wanting to be born as a pig is, is not exactly a spoiler in this context. Yeah, you don't want to be reborn a pig, yeah. any sort of un, un, so-called unclean animal. You don't want to be you know, born as a shrimp, I guess. Yeah. Um, that doesn't seem that great either, but um, <laughs> just I think I'd rather be a pig than a shrimp, I guess. Um, but um, yeah, it seems like a little bit better. I don't know. Um, but at any rate, um, non-Jewish people are have their own set of laws that uh, that they are expected to follow that are called the Noahide laws. Right. There's seven of those. And, and, and Noahide means connected with Noah. Um, Noah sure. This is so the. Uh, the idea is that Noah, as the patriarch of the human family after the flood, he, all Gentiles are his descendants. And so they're bound by the laws he was bound by, even though the law of Moses had not yet been given. Right, right. Although it does say that on the ark, there were seven clean animals and two unclean animals right after it says there were two of each. But whatever, right. you can leave that, leave that over there. Got to have um, something for sacrifices. It's something. <laughs> it's, a, it's a peculiar little thing how Noah would have known which ones are clean and unclean uh, prior to Moses being told which ones are. Uh, that must have been well, the, would, the, the B-roll of the Bible. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that would be part of my argument that the, I mean, depending on how you take the historicity of the Noah story, um, but this would be an example of some... Uh, people already regarding certain animals as clean and unclean. And then later that custom was formalized in the law of Moses. Right. It could be. I mean, it depends on what you think, how you think the Torah was knit together or written yeah. or, or, or what have you. Uh, but yeah, one, one could be born a Gentile. And in fact, uh, there are sections in the, the, in the Kabbalah and in the rabbinical literature where it says uh, it's way easier to repair the world as a Gentile. Mm -hmm. Because the expectation is just that you have these seven things to do. And as long as yeah. you believe in God and don't steal and don't lie and don't, you know, uh, eat an animal while it's still alive and things like that, um, the expectation is actually much easier. Um, don't be an animal vampire. Yeah, animal vampire. Don't, yeah, don't, uh, yeah, don't eat the animal. The blood's still in it. And, you know, basically don't be a bad person. The seven are not that hard. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, of course, being a Jewish person, the expectation is is very rigorous and I've met Kabbalists, um, real Kabbalists in the wild out there. And, uh, and they are, I mean, especially in the land of Israel where they tend to want to stay. Uh, I know Kabbalists who just won't leave Israel because they, mm -hmm. they believe that the rest of the world is impure and that uh, they, they go to the mikvah, the ritual bath every single day. And they try to live in an extremely heightened state of purity because they really do believe that, their purrity is part of the mechanism by which the world will be redeemed. So uh, let's we'll, so let's go there to the Messianic age. Um, is it a certainty? Number one, is it a certainty that the Messianic age will happen or could we mess it up? And it, when it does happen, what do they think the Messianic age will be like? How will it be different than now? Yeah. So this is where Judaism has a sort of weird allergy, even in Kabbalah, to speculating about the future. Um, in fact, the Talmud says that for every year that you calculate from now, the Messiah will come. God pushes the coming of the Messiah back that many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've always loved that. Like, you know, it's people <laughs> like the Messiah's going to come in 375 years. And God's like, uh-huh. And you just pushed it back. You got yourself 375 years more detention. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the idea is twofold in Kabbalah. One is either the world will be made a fit place for the Messiah by human effort. And the Messiah will simply walk through the door. That is to say the world will be basically redeemed mm -hmm. so much so that the, that the Messiah will come. They liken this to the idea that the King's not going to come to your house until you cleaned your house mm -hmm. until you've gotten your house beautiful. And when you've gotten everything, including the red carpet rolled out, then and only then will the King come. In Christian circles, this idea is sometimes called post-millennialism, that the, the gospel and the kingdom of God will eventually triumph to the point that Jesus will return from heaven as kind of the crowning event of all that. Right, right. And then we have the opposite, too. Mm -hmm. The other option is that the world will get so bad that the forces of evil will be a hair's breadth away from destroying the last righteous thing in the world. And at that decisive moment, the Messiah will appear. 
So, and it's only, and so it's either when things are perfect or really close to perfect or really close to a wreck, it's only in those two moments that Messiah will appear. And so the idea is it's far better to live in a world near perfection than live in a world where everything is basically evil and God has to kind of come in as a commando and, and, and fix it all. Mm-hmm. So that's the expectation. Now, how does that world different from our world? There's a bunch of speculation in the literature about that. Um, one version is that the dead will be resurrected. So all the dead people will be resurrected. Uh, the versions is that everyone. Will... So in Kabbalism, there are traditions where you have both reincarnation and an eventual resurrection. And, and an eventual resurrection. So, um, um, so there that exists. Uh, in fact, there's even images in the Talmud of like people rolling toward Jerusalem underground. I know through the underground tunnel. Yeah, the underground yeah. pop up at the Mount of Olives, and uh, and the Messiah can judge them by smell, which is interesting when the Messiah judges mm. them. Uh, like God will kind of and will know. Uh, what, what you did wrong. Don't have the odor of sanctity on this one. Yeah, exactly. And this is the way the Bible talks. It's like odor of sanctity. Like, you know, it was an aro- a pleasing aroma to Hashem, to God, that it's a very, very, you know, God's like a sommelier of righteousness and sin. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are other, I think, gross stories where everyone has to convert to uh, Judaism and everyone will follow the laws of Israel. Um, there are even more horrifying versions where all of the, the Gentiles become the slaves of the, the Jews. I think that's repugnant. It's there. And it's well, a minority position, but it's it's there in some of the texts. Will will things like um so like in, in the Christian articulation, in the in the final state of the world, death will no longer exist. And also we won't if we're not dying, we're not going to need to reproduce, so we won't be married. Will things like um will things like death and sexual reproduction continue to happen? Good question. Um, and there's debate about this. And there's even debate about how long the Messiah will reign. In some versions of it, the Messiah will reign for a thousand years. And it'll be a normal world like this. That is, say, you live, die, have kids. Just people won't sin anymore. There just won't be sin. Even the animals won't sin anymore. They won't hurt each other. Um, or some people think all the bad, the mean animals will vanish and all mm-hmm. the good animals will remain. Or some say that the lion will lay down with the lamb and they'll both still exist. Um, so in some versions, there'll be a thousand years where the Messiah will rule and then something else happens. And that something else is even less speculated upon, whether it's some kind of complete renovation of the world, absorbed back into the, in, into the Godhead. No one knows. Um, okay. Yeah, Judaism is very scant on speculation about the future. The afterlife, uh, what is called Olam Haba, the world to come. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have anecdotes about it, that there'll be no sickness there. Uh, but then sometimes they'll say, no, the people will still live and die. They may live older. They may get to much older and live and die. Uh, but they may still live and die. The Messiah may, will live and die. The Messiah will, will live for a thousand years and bring peace to earth. But eventually that will also come to an end and there'll be something else. So exactly what that stuff is, is... Um, it's very peculiar. Even uh, prophecies about what the Messiah will, will be like mm-hmm. is um, it's very scant. So one of the things that has struck me in learning about Kabbalah is its similarities. It has certain similarities to a movement that listeners may be aware of in Christian history known as Gnosticism. Um, now, there's there used to be more debate about was Gnosticism a pre-Christian phenomenon, but these days it seems like most scholars agree that it emerged like in the second century. That's when it really got rolling and in a, in a primarily Christian context. And Gnosticism claims that um, that it's based on secret knowledge that has been passed down. And so what Christian Gnostics would say is that Jesus gave a whole bunch of teachings which are exoteric that were proclaimed by the apostles. So those were meant to be public. But then there's also a secret set of teachings or esoteric teachings that he gave not necessarily to all the apostles, but to somebody. And then those have now been released to the public. So you've got that's a similarity to what Kabbalists believe. Um, Also, in the uh, in in the common Gnostic vision of how God works or how the divine realm works, you have an ultimate unknowable 
God and then these emanations from God called aeons or eons um, that are kind of like the spherot, um, although they're not the same. And right. then you have um, the origin of evil is also rooted in these divine emanations, that something goes wrong in the process of the emanations, and that leads to us living in a fallen world. And so there are a bunch of similarities here, at least notable ones, between Christian Gnosticism and Kabbalah. And so I sometimes think of Kabbalah as like, okay, it's kind of the Jewish equivalent of Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Do you think that comparison has merit? So there, there's, I guess there's two questions there. One question is, is there a historical connection between um, right. Christian Gnosticism and the Gnosticism of the late classical world um, and Kabbalah in the Middle Ages? And the answer to there is, we don't know. Everybody and their brother has looked for a connection to the Cathars and to the Waldensians and to the Bogomils, and everyone's trying to find the, the link, the, the one letter from one rabbi to a Cathar or something. We've mm -hmm. never found it. Um, also, there are enough technical dissimilarities mm -hmm. between the Kabbalah and ancient Gnosticism to show that they're not quite that similar. And third, we can see Kabbalistic ideas developing in the centuries prior to the Zohar. So what's weird is that we see similar ideas on the scene and they mature over several hundred years. All right? And what we see is that that maturation process seems to be the case that they're generating a similar track of thinking without there being any historical connection. So at, the, at this point, most scholars think there's no historical connection between the two. Right. But what is the connection? Neoplatonism, right? Is that mm -hmm. the Platonic world, the Neoplatonic world, if you think of sort of Christian Gnosticism as sort of an inversion of Neoplatonism, where in the Neoplatonic world, God emanates everything out, and we're sort of the very end of the ladder in terms of the chain of being, and we're really close to evil, but not quite. Well, the Gnostics say, no, actually, everything below this part is all evil. They just move where the evil bar is at some level, and it happens to be the entire physical world. Even Plotinus rejected that. He was like, no, the physical world is a manifestation of the divine. You can't hate it. You, you can want to not be trapped by it, but it's not evil. Mm -hmm. Plotinus, we should explain, was a Neoplatonic philosopher. Right. Third century uh, Neoplatonic philosopher who also did not like Gnosticism as much as the, his, as the Christians did, didn't. Um, at least the ones that weren't Gnostic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what's going on there is that what explains the similarities is that when you start from basically an idea of an infinitely removed God and you have to get to a finite existence and you have to explain the problem of evil. And if the mechanism that you use to do that is emanations, these sort of cascading overflows of the divine, every system that does that is going to get a very similar story in the end. Mm -hmm. So I think that the similarities, I wouldn't call them a coincidence, but I would say that they're, they're actually just the result of when you accept certain kinds of positions, other kinds of positions necessarily flow if you follow logic. And I think that the, yeah. Kabbalah, the Kabbalah and the Gnostics end up looking similar. Um, right. I didn't mean that it's descended from Christian right. Gnosticism. It's I would because I'm unaware of any historical language as well. So I okay. think of it as parallel evolution. Yeah, but, I think that's yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening there is a very similar kind of because we see the same thing happen in the Islamic world. It's really shocking how very similar some Islamic forms of uh, of mysticism look very Kabbalistic, even though they're developing parallel to each other hundreds of years apart. Mm -hmm. um so but yeah there it's are like, weird like jehovah's witnesses reinvented arianism right right and then they and who knows to the degree or uh even i would say the latter-day saints at some level also reinvent a kind of gnosticism of their own mm -hmm. uh, which is very interesting you become kings and queens of these eternal celestial kingdoms and stuff and you're like oh yeah i heard that before and um, we have these souls that all all pre-exist and so forth yeah. So and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that there's no central authority in Judaism, uh, unlike in, in some forms of Christianity. And if an idea gets out and people persuasively argue for it, it can get it can take hold. It can get a life of its own. Um, Kabbalah did that. Although I will say that after the whole Shabbatai V business in the 17th century, this false messiah that em emerged, uh, the Kabbalah took a big hit. Um, mm -hmm. It took a big hit. It was actually heavily restricted after that. 
folks may have heard these rules where you have to be you have to be 40 and you have to be married and you have to to study the Kabbalah. All those rules came after this uh, disaster with this false messiah. So because um, many Kabbalists and non Kabbalists, the non Kabbalists that told you so, look what you did. Like, mm-hmm. look at this stuff. Look what they did. And the Kabbalists were like, yeah, we we went too far. Uh, we were too eager. We 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 gave people too much before they could handle it. And, you know, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And sure enough, what it came, what dropped out of the deal with was uh, Shabbat Tzvi. Uh, so we've covered uh, the opposition that there's been to Kabbalah at various stages in Jewish history. How common is it today? And like, is it found in some groups more than others? Obviously, we mentioned Hasidism, where it's where it's that that essentially is a Kabbalistic movement, right? It's baked right in. But how about uh, in other Jewish communities? Is um, is it common in some and rare in others, or what's the demographics of that like? And how much opposition is there to it today? I would say that in the liberal world, the progressive liberal Jewish world, um, it's becoming more popular. just to say, so it was, it was, you, it was basically canon in the Orthodox world prior to the 19th century. And what ended up happening was that um, as progressive modern Judaism was developing, the conservative movement, the reform movement, they were facing extreme anti-Semitism. And one way of dealing with that anti-Semitism was to basically bury all this stuff. And they, when they developed their movements, the reform movement, the, Re- the constructionist movement, the conservative movement, they just rejected it all because they were terrified they would make them look bizarre. And what they were interested in was looking basically like Jewish Lutherans in Germany. Mm-hmm. And it failed, right? It didn't, Hitler didn't care that they were yeah. progressive. It didn't matter to him. And so uh, in the progressive Jewish movement, I would say that people know about it. People are interested in it. But the degree to which an average person at a reform synagogue is a Kabbalist, you probably have the one hippie weirdo, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, there'll be one person, you know, that'll be into it. Um, and the ultra orthodox world, the orthodox world, it's much more common. It's much more baked in, but it also falls along ethnic lines. So uh, Hasidic people will, uh, Eastern European people will be much more into it. Uh, Yemeni people, Moroccan people will be into it. Sephardi people will be much more into it. Sephardi people are people typically from uh, Spain, the right. descendants of people from Spain, but also people from Greece because they were exiled to Greece. Whereas Lithuanians, for instance, will be very opposed to it. Um, that's where the heartland of the opponents of Hasidism were. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it does. Sounds, it sounds like ethnically it's common among kind of around the Mediter- people who stem from around the Mediterranean basin. Yeah, it's more popular there. Um, but even among the more hardline people, uh, I'll give an example of Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon was a, 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 an 18th century a scholar who deeply hated the Hasidic movement. He thought they were just all heretics. He excommunicated all of them. But he was a Kabbalist under the hood. He just thought that he did it right. They did it wrong. Uh, and so, uh, so it's one of those things where even rationally minded Orthodox Jews can still be skeptical of it, but still mm-hmm. accept it at some level. Um, okay. Um, let's talk about the influence that Kabbalah has had outside of the Jewish community. Now, historically, there has been a kind of Christian Kabbalah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So there was, uh, beginning in the 15th century in, in the Renaissance, um, Christian, some Christians began to believe that Jews, despite their backwardness or whatever, uh, had secrets that actually did come from Moses. And these secrets were primeval secrets that had been maintained by the Jewish people. They basically accepted what the Kabbalists were arguing. They just thought that the Jews, because they didn't accept Christianity, were basically, um, I don't know, blindly carrying it about. Yeah. They didn't understand what they had. Mm -hmm. And so some Christians in Italy and Florence began to work directly with, um, they began to work directly with Jews to begin translating a lot of this stuff into Latin and with the help mostly of converted Jews. So these would be Jews that had converted to Christianity and they would use their Jewish knowledge to translate a lot of this Kabbalistic stuff into, uh, into Latin. 
a lot of it pretty unreliably. And sometimes they just made stuff up. Uh Um, And so that began the world of Christian Kabbalah, where the argument was there, the Zohar and other texts in Kabbalah prove the truth of Christianity and that a kind of hybridized version of Catholicism or Protestantism, but mostly Catholicism could be hybridized with Kabbalah. And that would actually allow for the Jews to convert in to Catholicism. It basically would be a bootstrap to get them in. Um, and this work. idea was not well received by the actual teaching authority of the church. No, it was not received by basically the, the Kabbalists didn't like it uh-huh. uh, uh, and the church did not like it. Um, right. And so people that were associated with it, um, they were on the, yeah, these were people that were on the fringes of the religious world to some degree. I mean, Pico was kind of on the fringe. Pacino was less so. But yeah, some of these people. Uh, the, the, those being Christian Kabbalists. Christian Kabbalists. And some of these people would eventually develop Christian as of terrorism, Christian occultism. The most famous mm-hmm. example being uh, Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy, published in 1533, mm-hmm. which is uh, most systematic. It's the summa of this systematization between uh, magic, Kabbalah, Christianity as a, as a whole, basically the foundational document of modern occultism. Mm-hmm. So um, fast forwarding to the 20th century, we have uh, an organization that you mentioned earlier, the Kabbalah Center in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. What's, what's the deal with them? So they're very polarizing. Um, and I don't want to contribute to that because I really feel like as an academic, my job is never to denigrate anyone's right. you know, spirituality. You could, you could describe what the controversy is about. The controversy is to what degree Kabbalah should be, quote unquote, watered down to make it accessible to anyone who wants to engage with it. Jews, non-Jews, movie stars, rabbis, whatever. And uh, what their argument is, is that this can be accessible to anybody. And the teachings of the, of the Kabbalah can be accessible to, to any person. And that influential people should be prioritized maybe in that process um, because they will help spread these ideas and usher in the era of the redemption all the faster. So it, it's kind of a Hollywood version of mm-hmm. Hollywood, new agey version of, of Kabbalah that, again, many people find deeply spiritually rewarding. Madonna is a famous example of a person who has clearly benefited spiritually from it. Uh, mm-hmm. Ariana Grande um, and some other people as well have uh, have really found teachings in the Kabbalah to be spiritually fulfilling uh, for them. It doesn't require you convert to Judaism. It doesn't require that you do the Jewish law. It says that these teachings are actually accessible to anyone at any level. And so the job is that the job of that organization is to to raise the possibilities of redemption by making it accessible to a wide range of people. Okay. And it's led to a kind of what's sometimes called pop Kabbalah, where you have this presentation of of Kabbalistic ideas for a non-Jewish audience. Um, and I imagine the transmission, uh, I imagine something gets lost in transmission in that process from the perspective of a lot of Kabbalists. Um, what for, would... Yeah, from the tradition, from the perspective of a traditional Kabbalah, Kabbalist, I'm sure they would have a very low opinion of... Mm-hmm. Of, of what's going on there. Also, people who are popularizing a movement like this frequently, like converts to it, like Madonna, let's say, may not represent, they may say, oh yeah, this thing is Kabbalistic or this thing is Kabbalah, when really it's more of an idiosyncratic idea that's not broadly shared. Um, so there's a danger of misrepresenting, you know, like for example, um, you have uh, new age people who will talk about Christianity and they will say things like the early Christians believed in reincarnation. And it's like, yeah, the kind of, no, no, not really. And um, I can imagine that as, and that's kind of a a popularization of an esoteric ideas. And we have something similar going on with, you know, Kabbalah is esoteric. And then you have this modern popularizations of it. Are there particular things that people should be aware of that may be distortions or other considerations people should be aware of when they encounter pop Kabbalah? This would, this would probably, I think answering that might veer me into insider baseball where i would want where i might be required to say what is authentic kabbalah and what isn't and from an academic point of view i can't do that i right. wouldn't feel responsible doing that mm-hmm. um 
I guess what I would say is that I would sort of give general advice is that if you're going to be in contact with the spirituality of an oppressed people, whatever oppressed people that is, whether it's Jewish people, African Americans, uh, indigenous Americans, be in communication with those communities and learn from those communities and with those communities. And I think that when there's kind of a taking of ideas from communities that have been traditionally oppressed, um, but when that's an asymmetrical taking, I think that that's just worrying. And so, um, yeah, I think it's always a good idea to dig deeper, to be in communication with the communities of people that develop these ideas. And uh, also people are selling you stuff. Mm-hmm. Just be, be aware. I mean, if someone's offering you spiritual truths and they want money, um, just let that raise your hackles. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think when people are selling salvation, um, um, I'm, I, that always worries me. Uh, and this goes for Jews too. And I've been to Safed and I'll go to places and I'm like, yeah, I'll tell you who your soul route is as long as you pay me $1,200 or whatever. I'm like, mm. yeah, I, I think I'm a pass. Um, yeah. On that. In the Christian community, we didn't have such a good experience with Simon Magus. Yeah. Simon Magus. I mean, I, I think we all have our history of, uh, of, of the, you know, we all have history where money and religion mix and it ruins both at some level. Uh, politics and religion and whether it's uh, the abuse of the indulgences in the middle ages or whether it was unscrupulous uh, money changers in the temple or um or you know predatory lending in the middle ages or things like that i think that um yeah um i think that 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 intersection always worries me um so before we close anything else you'd like us to know about our topic today i would say that the Kabbalah is rich and sophisticated and that the, you know, the presentation of it, you know, we've done today is a good, you know, tipping in. If you're interested to learn more about it, uh, my channel, Esoterica, we, we talk about topics in Kabbalah a lot. I've done a whole 14 hour long class on Kabbalah. If you really want to learn about Kabbalah from an academic perspective, not from a I've watched of, it. Of, of, okay. Um, I, I hope that was useful. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that if folks want to dive into it, uh, I think that, you know, it's always good to learn more about what people believe and, um, and that the more we learn about each other, I think the better the world we live in. That I, I love reading Patristic Fathers and learning about Catholicism and learning about uh, my Catholic brothers and sisters and their beliefs. And it doesn't make them want to become Catholic, but I feel like um, that faith seeking understanding is a lot better than faith seeking weapons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I'm always happy to learn with and from my, my, uh, my Catholic and, and Christian and Muslim brothers and sisters, my, you know, uh, my Confucians and Buddhists. And if folks want to learn more about uh, Kabbalah with no invitation that you have to be a Kabbalist, um, that there's some, there, you know, my channel is a, is a, is a decent resource for that, yeah. for that activity. And I've frequently uh, watched your channel, um, and there's a lot of fascinating stuff in there it, it, dealing with esoteric matters, hence the name, Esoterica. Um, we'll have a link to it in the, uh, in the description for, uh, for the show notes. Um, and I share the same attitude of, you know, we can learn from each other. We may not agree on everything, but we can, we can be respectful and kind and, and have mutually enriching exchanges that we can learn from, which is why I wanted to bring you on today. I really appreciate that. Yeah, the world the world is better with richer, deeper conversations about how we're different. And difference does not, you know, difference and disagreement can coexist with respect. Mm-hmm. And so I think um, that, and that's also true for me. I'm not a Kabbalist. And so I'm, yeah. I, I'll be having a conversation with a Kabbalist. <laughs> be like, yeah, you guys believe weird stuff, neat stuff, but weird. And I'll be, mm-hmm. you know, looking at my, you know, my Christian people like, y'all also believe strange stuff. And, and they would look at me and say, you believe weird stuff too, or you don't believe weird stuff. Yeah. What's wrong with you? So I think that we can all, uh, you know, if we, if we can all agree that, uh, that we all hold some far out ideas and, and reach out to each other and, and knowledge and, and compassion, then the world's going to get to be a better place. And I think that does actually set us on the path to a, a, a kind of redemption. And um, I'm, I certainly want to be part of that. Well, Dr. Justin Sledge, thank you so much for being with us today on Mysterious World. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jimmy. All right, that's the end of our discussion with Dr. Sledge. Jimmy, what can we say about Kabbalah from the faith perspective? 
Despite the fact that some in history have tried to combine Kabbalah with Christianity, the two are fundamentally different. Uh, Christianity teaches that God is eternal or outside of time, so he doesn't undergo processes and progress in stages across time. That's what the world does, not what God does. God is perfect, and so he doesn't have any brokenness within himself, so we don't need to help repair God. Also, Christianity teaches that God did not cause evil to exist. Instead, evil is due to the misuse of the gift of free will by God's creatures. There are ways in which we cooperate with God by doing good in the world and helping build his kingdom. So in that sense, we do participate in tikkun olam or the repair of the world by doing acts of kindness and love. Uh, But as I said in the interview, we ain't fixing God. And finally, the Christian vision of the afterlife does not involve reincarnation. Instead, God showed us what will happen to us by what happened to his son. After Jesus died, he rose from the dead without reincarnating, and that's what will happen to us at the end of time. As Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed for men once to die, and after that comes judgment. Despite this, it's helpful to know what other people believe, and to have respectful discussions with them, including Kabbalists and people who aren't Kabbalists, like Dr. Sledge. So I'd like to thank him for coming on the show, and I hope to have him back in the future to discuss more fascinating esoteric subjects, including parts of Jewish history and folklore. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what is your bottom line on Kabbalah? Kabbalah is a form of Jewish mysticism that is in some ways parallel to Christian Gnosticism. Like Gnosticism, it involves the idea of secret teachings being passed down, a a series of divine emanations, and it places the origin of evil in the divine realm. Despite this, we don't have historical evidence that Gnosticism influenced Kabbalah, but they do look like they developed in a kind of parallel conceptual evolution. With the internet, Kabbalah is becoming increasingly popular in some circles, so it's important to know about it and how it relates to both traditional Jewish and Christian faiths. And what further resources can we offer to the listener and viewer? We'll have links to information about Kabbalah, as well as Dr. Sledge's Esoterica channel, also his uh, Esoterica playlist on Kabbalah with his multi-part course on it, and also a link to his personal website. Great. What do we have for mysterious headlines this week, Jimmy? A creepy robotics theme. Um, First, we will have a couple of links. One of them is a summary and one of them is the home website of a an object called the prayer, which is described as a terrifying robotic mouth that chants AI generated prayers. (laughs) And uh, so, yeah, some people built a robotic mouth and they have a speech synthesizer attached to it and they hooked it up to an AI, which they fed religious texts from all over the worlds. And if you turn it on, it will chant AI generated prayers and praises of God until you have the courage to rip the cord out of the wall. (laughs) Um, So it is quite creepy. Um, Also, speaking of creepy robotic things, well, you know how in the Terminator movie, the Terminator was like covered in human skin? They're doing that Um, because it turns out that um, robotic skin hasn't been hugely successful. And so now they have been making living human skin out of living human skin cells uh, to cover robotic things with. There's a robotic finger that has now been covered with the new living skin. And right now the skin is pretty basic. It doesn't sweat yet, which it needs to because it needs to keep moist. But uh, but more creepy robotic stuff going on. People, these dystopian science fiction movies are not templates for the future. Please don't do this. <laughs> wow, those are some awesome headlines. All right. So we would love to hear from you. What are your theories about Kabbalah and its teachings? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. Send a tweet to at mys underscore world. Join the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, where we have a Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World channel, or call our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. 
And I want to say a special word of thanks to the folks at Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they did on this episode of Mysterious World. Uh, they do really great work, so check them out if you have any needs for uh, video editing or animation. Um, you can see their work by going to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, where you can watch Mysterious World videos. We've been getting a lot of positive feedback from people about uh, the added benefits uh, of the video. You know, in addition to the information we present in the audio form of the podcast, people have been really impressed with what they're doing. And while you're there, I am trying to grow my YouTube channel, so I'd really appreciate it if you uh, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so that you'll always get a notification whenever I have a new video, whether it's Mysterious World or something else. And if you haven't seen the video yet, you haven't been able to see the little Jimmy Dom animations around the screen, at least go check that out. There, I love those. Those are great. Uh, so, Jimmy, what are we going to talk about next time? Next time, we're going to be talking about another religious mystery, but this one is a little closer to home. Next time, we're going to be discussing Eucharistic miracles and what recent scientific studies of them have shown. Awesome. Very good. Folks, get your very own Mysterious World t-shirt or mug and more in our merchandise shop at sqpn.com slash merch, M-E-R-C-H. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the Mysterious headlines on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 219. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. 